we've not met before, my name is Christian Smith. I am our pastor of leadership development here at TLCC, and I'm so excited to be able to share a little bit with you today to participate in our current series called uh, Thrive, where we've been talking about the different ways that we can try and flourish in every aspect of our lives. And today, I am going to be talking about thriving physically, about thriving in our bodies. Now, today, I tried to pick out my uh, blazer that was the tightest and would make you all think that I had flourishing muscles. However, that, that would have to be specially custom built, I think. Um, so I don't want you all to think that I uh, am so presumptuous as to assume that I am the uh, expert nor a paragon of physical health who will be able to give you all of the uh, scientific, biological necessities and tips for how to flourish in your body. And I'm sure many of you here know more and do more uh, in, in those sorts of ways than I do. You know, I have to throw weights around, you know, a handful of times a week and stuff like that. However, again, many of you uh, uh, have, are more advanced in those sorts of ways. So I hope that you will take what I say today as a pastoral and a theological perspective, the things that I am good at, um, and, oh, I hope so. Uh, you'll be the judge today, I reckon. Uh, the things that I focus on, and to hopefully be encouraged to learn about how we can thrive physically in our bodies. So there's a, a famous story about two uh, pastoral and theological heavyweights from the 19th century uh, named Dwight Moody and Charles Spurgeon, and Spurgeon invited D.L. Moody to speak at, at an event that he was hosting. So Moody accepted the invitation, and he preached the entire time about the evils of tobacco and why the Lord doesn't want Christians to smoke. Spurgeon, who had invited Moody to his own event, was an avid cigar smoker. He was surprised at what seemed to be a cheap shot leveled by Moody using the pulpit to condemn a fellow minister for violating an issue of personal conscience, Moody's own conscience. Now, Moody, who was the guy who was invited talking against tobacco, he was a bit of an overweight guy. So when Moody finished preaching and walked off the stage, Spurgeon walked up to the podium and said, Mr. Moody, I'll put down my cigars when you put down your fork. See, we all have areas where we could be physically healthier, Right? And hopefully we all have areas where we want to be physically healthier, where we desire to be healthier. But we may wonder whether or not our physical bodily health is something that we as a community of believers should be focused on. We at TLCC and many throughout the church community and the history of the church believe that every area of our lives should flourish. We've been speaking about the flourishing of our social, emotional, and spiritual lives in recent weeks, but we also believe that we are supposed to flourish physically, bodily. However, oftentimes our world promotes a worldview that diminishes the physical body, and I think that this often takes place in two ways. So, First of all, there's one popular kind of secular way, if you will, of approaching the body, which is kind of to say, my body is an amusement park intended for pleasure. Um, I don't know if you all holy people are familiar with a man named Steve-O from uh, the Jack Rear End movies that I watched in secret with my friends when I was a teenager without my parents knowing. We all go and do crazy physical activities, risking bodily harm, possibly death, uh, what looks like upon, you know, like a, on a daily uh, uh, routine and schedule, and uh, he said something to the effect of, my body is a roller coaster that I ride till I die. So under this perspective, our body is it's really whatever we want it to be. It's to be used how we want to use it. It can be a trash can for bad things that we want to put into it. It can be a symbol of social status that we cultivate and grow and inject, et cetera, so that we can show the world something about ourselves. Our bodies can be a sexual object that gives us some sort of pleasure. The body is, under this view, ultimately and merely a fleshly vehicle to get us what we want, whether good or bad. Now, Christian folk may disagree with this perspective out of hand. We want to, you know, stay away from some of those sorts of uh, immoralities and not use our body in negative sorts of ways. However, Christians also very often promote a view which similarly diminishes the body. See, Christians often promote a worldview 
which says that the body is a mere vessel and it promotes the soul or the, or the spirit as the ultimate, really Im- only important part of our being. We often talk about very explicitly, and this is very well known about the Western church, about our bodies merely housing our soul. Therefore, our body does not really matter that much. It's ultimately the spiritual and material stuff that matters. Theologian and uh, Professor Greg Allison tells a story in his book called Embodied uh, about a young man who came to his office and he was really struggling in his life and his name was Drake. Allison writes, Drake rehearsed a list of of, of disconcerting physical problems. He had difficulty sleeping. He was experiencing stomach problems and there's going to be some, you know, physical stuff here. So, uh, you know, cover your ears if you have to. Constipation, physical problems, stomach problems, constipation. He was lethargic, barely having energy for normal life activities. He had blood in areas that he shouldn't have blood. He found it difficult to pay attention in conversations. He couldn't remember the ideas he had just read in books. So here he was in my office. He wanted my advice about how to become well again. But my questions caught him off guard, Greg Allison writes. What are you eating? Drake was consuming a large regular amount of junk food, living like a couch potato. Are you scheduling rest periods? He explained he was too busy for relaxation. Are you getting good sleep? He reminded me that one of his problems was insomnia. Drake was clearly becoming irritated with my line of questioning. He wondered what spiritual causes could lie at the heart of these physical symptoms. And he offered the following. Because his body was going to be sloughed off at death anyway, he didn't need to be concerned about eating well, resting well, exercising well, and sleeping well. All those bodily matters were irrelevant and useless. Drake was not pleased. My response wasn't the answer a spiritually minded Christian like him was accustomed to hearing or wanted to hear. He had come to me with an expectation that I'd share something with him from the word of God. With an angry huff, Drake stormed out of my office. Now, from our perspectives, again, sitting in this room right now, it may be very... Uh, easy to look at Drake and go, uh, this is kind of an absurd approach. Obviously, he needs to address these issues. But the reality is, is that a lot of us do look at life implicitly in this sort of way who grow up and live in the Christian community. The body is a mere temporary vessel. It's going to be sloughed off at the end of death. Flourishing doesn't truly, or maybe true flourishing doesn't include the physical body, bodily life because ultimately what matters and will last eternally is our soul's our spirits. We sometimes act like and talk like God cares about our souls and not our bodies. But if we want to be holistically flourishing people, we must realize that God cares immensely about the body. In fact, God came not just to save your soul, but to save your physical body. Now, this is most clearly seen in the fact the sometimes disconcerting and confusing and mysterious fact that we will be resurrected in bodies at the end of time. So when we think about our eternal lives or living in heaven, as we often say it, we must always remember that the church has always taught and always believed that the eternal future is a physical future. That at the end of time, when Jesus comes back, He's going to bring heaven down to earth. Heaven comes down to earth and renews the earth. Again, how exactly is this going to happen? We don't know, but scripture is very clear in it. I don't have time to go into all of that. We're going to live in a physical renewed earth, and then we will live in that renewed earth with presumably, I don't know, walls and a ground and floors and trees and rivers and lamps and whatever, that we are also going to have physical bodies in that world. In 1 Corinthians 15, I could read tons of scripture about this, but I'll just do this one. Uh, Paul is talking to a, a group of people who do not believe in the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of the dead at the end of time. And, uh, and he says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the, de- from the dead, because Jesus was raised physically from the dead, right? After he died and then he rose and he had his body that could be touched and he could eat food and all that sort of good stuff. If It is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead, of us, of people? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. 
But he did not raise but but he did not raise him, God didn't, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Meaning if people who, who are not here now, they have passed away, if they're leaving in some sort of intermediate state, but they're never going to be resurrected from the dead, well, the goal is to live. That the God's eternal goal is that we're going to have a physical world to live in. Those people who are currently passed away and in an intermediate soulish state, what's going to happen to them? They're, where are they? They have perished. They're supposed to come back to physical bodies. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. So what the scripture is essentially saying, I know I'm talking about a lot of heavy theological stuff. Some of you are aware of, uh, some of you are not. I might be dropping bombs on you. Just stay with me here if you will. What the scripture is essentially saying is that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead and Jesus is the representation of who and what we are supposed to be. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we are also to rise from the dead in, in glorified bodies, scripture talks about, or spiritual bodies, which doesn't mean uh, a physical bodies, it means spirit powered bodies. Um, it's like going to an electric car instead of like a gasoline powered car. The car is still the car, it's just a different sort of way of moving the car forward. Our eternal bodies, it's like the, the, the energy that's given to it is different. Instead of it being from our kind of messed up sinful nature, we, in, the, in, the, in the eternal future we have this spirit fuel that's giving us, that's driving us forward. So if we do not rise bodily from the dead, as the scripture is saying, then Jesus didn't need to rise bodily from the dead either, for he would have been saving something which did not need to be saved. You see, Jesus' bodily resurrection was an affirmation of our bodies. Jesus came to bring flourishing, holy, renewed lives. And part of what Jesus' death and salvation brings is not mere salvation of your soul, but salvation of your body as well. So we see the goodness and importance of the body to God throughout uh, the whole course of Scripture. And here's just some quick ways to look at this. God made people, who ha- God made people to have bodies, Originally, that was his original goal, and God said that those bodies were good. The way that we were created was good in Genesis. In Song of Solomon, you have a lot of dialogue about the romantic body, about the joys of being able to, in the proper context, hopefully, to be able to enjoy the romantic, positive, physical body. I recently read a study about the use of the word beauty in the Hebrew, too complex to go into, but it highlights that beauty is often attributed to the physical body. In Psalm 139, we see this famous passage, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame, which I've seen other translations in a fun way uh, 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 translate that as my skeleton. It's talking about how our, our bodies are knit together. Our persons, our whole persons are knit together. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your body is good. And Jesus cares about your body both now and forevermore. Something about your body is good. And if God thinks it's good, then you need to have a positive view of it, or you need to prescribe value to your body in the same way that God prescribes value to your body now and forevermore. Now, there's still the reality that our physical bodies are not the be-all, end-all, right? So we need, we need to temper this in some sort of way. Some of us may need to think about getting a little bit healthier, right? But some of us may need to spend less time focusing on our bodies, especially in our world today that promotes a certain sort of vision of the body and that if you attain that sort of body, then you, know, then, then you have achieved some sort of success in your life. So we need to be careful about this. There's a famous verse with Paul writing to uh, Timothy. He says, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. We cannot focus so much on our bodies that we forget about things like character formation, practicing the spiritual disciplines. You know, if you have 30 minutes tomorrow in the morning to pick between, you know, lifting weights and praying, I would probably encourage you to spend time praying, right? 
Maybe you can go on a walk and pray at the same time. That could be good, All right? But, but having conversation with God, this is more important. But what does the scripture say too? Bodily training is of some value, which is really interesting. You don't hear about that kind of stuff in the church all that often. That's God speaking to us through scripture saying, guess what? You need to care about your body because your body is important to my plan for your life and my plan for the world as well. Okay, so hopefully, everyone tracking with me? Everyone all right? Okay, hopefully you all believe me that the body is important by this point. But I want to ask the question of, why is the body important? What is it about the body that makes it something of value to God? And I'll just talk about a couple of ways that we can, be, that we can view this. First of all, our bodies are integral to every single part of our engagement with the world and God. So, sometimes I think that we think we engage in physical activities and a physical, non-physical activities. We kind of split activities into different parts of our mind. So physical activity is something like, you know, you're running, walking, lifting weights, playing a sport, stretching, whatever it might be. And then there are, there are non-physical, a-physical activities, like maybe strategizing, you're thinking at work, you're reading and learning, you're listening to a podcast. It's not necessarily a physical activity. And then the really, really important activities, like praying, reading scripture, singing songs of worship to God, these are like the peak moments most important activities that we can do, and they are above all spiritual activities that are not about the body. It's like, I, I think oftentimes when we conceive of prayer, for instance, it's like we're, we're sitting there with our eyes closed in a dark room, and we're like, our soul is directly, I don't know why our soul is there, but doesn't it feel that way? Our soul right here, this amorphous blob orb is like directly touching God's spirit. And we're having a spirit to spirit, which is a phrase that we use in our society, right? We're having like a spirit to spirit, like touching with God and communication with God. So if you are struggling in like the most important parts of your life and your prayer life, then you may think that you are spiritually, soulishly off. But let me tell you that if you wake up at 6.30 a.m. tomorrow and you're sitting down to spend 30 minutes in prayer, and you're having a lot of trouble focusing with uh, 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 your mind on God and having conversation with God and, and forming coherent thoughts with God. It may not be that you have something off with your soul. It may be the greasy sausage pizza you ate last night that prevented you from having a good sleep. When you are praying, you are not engaging in an a-physical, immaterial activity. You pray through and with your body. Your soul communicates through and with your body. When you're reading scripture, if you didn't get much sleep the night before, you may not digest any of the scripture that you are reading. You know, sometimes when your eyes just gloss over a page and it's like, what did I just read for these last, last five pages? Now I have to go back. That happens to me, right? And, and it's like, man, I'm just like off. Like, I don't know what's going on exactly. And we think that it might be a soul issue. But in reality, you might just not be rested enough. You might have, you know, been on your phone too much the night before and had too much blue light too late in the night. Your circadian rhythms are off and you woke up and you felt bad and your, your, your cognition was just completely off. There is this interconnectedness going on in the different aspects of our life. If you're not enjoying church today, if you think I'm a bad communicator, it might be because you're on TikTok too much and your dopamine is, you know, messed up. So it's not me, it's you, is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. No, I'm just kidding. Prayer, reading scripture, loving people. These are not soulish activities. They are, but they are not soulish activities alone. But these are embodied activities. Everything we do is with and through our bodies. We are bodies. We are not souls that have bodies. Very important. We are not souls that have bodies. We are embodied souls. Therefore, physical health is a significant contributor to our spiritual health and vice versa. Part of the point is that you can never fully split 
with how we are composed as human beings in a field called theological anthropology that discusses this. How we are composed as people, what we are, is that we are both spiritual and physical beings that are combined and are not supposed to be separated. What is death and why is death so bad? Because it is the death of our body and we are not supposed to physically die. That is the effects of sin, death. Okay, second of all, uh, why are our bodies important? They are God's gift to us that we are to properly use and take care of. So let's say someone you know, uh, uh, gives you a car for like Christmas or something, and you really needed a car, and then uh, you end up keeping it parked in the garage and using it as, say, a dressing room. The person who gave you the car would not only probably be wildly confused, but a little bit hurt, right? It's like, hey, like, this is, like, I just gave you a really nice gift that you needed to utilize, and it's a perfectly well-functioning car that you can utilize. Sometimes I think that we can realize that we have been given the gift of the body that God wants us to utilize for its purposes in the world and for his purposes, but we treat it like it's, you know, a roller coaster ride or an amusement park or a trash can or an idol that ends up becoming the most important things in our lives. So, you know, in a more, much more serious note, Paul talks about how we can improperly use the gift of the body. Um, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking to the church that is dealing with some sexual immorality. And he says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Something fascinating here and extends to beyond the, the, the licentious activity that he's discussing here to how we are treating our bodies in general as well that our bodies are gifts to us, but we can sin against the physical aspect in some unique way of our bodies by engaging in things that the body is not intended to engage in. And therefore, we are degrading the gift that we have been given by God. All right, imagine something else. Imagine someone is... Uh, is Think, think about the person that you would m most love to spend a day with. All right, think for a second. Is it like, you know, some musician or movie director or uh, I don't know. It could be anyone in history, let's say. Jesus isn't on the table. That's too easy. Um, all right, so imagine that. And then imagine that they're going to come over and spend the whole day in your house. All right. What are you going to go do? You're going to, you get a text right now saying, you know, um, Who's uh, uh, someone that isn't controversial that I could say? I don't know. Everyone's controversial these days, right? Whoever your controversial person is, they're in your mind right now. We all know. Don't whisper to the person next to you. Um, and they're coming over, and you get a text right now. What are you going to do? You're probably going to get up and leave this message. You're going to go home. You're going to start mopping the floor, right? It's like, we're going to be here the whole day. We have to make room for activities. And we're going to go, and we're going to, you know, get fun stuff to do. And we're going to prepare the house for this person to come here. Right? So that it is a proper place for this person to hang out with you in. Our bodies are the place that God comes to hang out with us. Our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And so why is there such an issue here with how the Corinthians are using their bodies? It's because God is with them while they're doing messed up stuff. And he's going, this isn't the kind of stuff that I'm about. But I want to be with you. I want to be present with you. I want to do meaningful things with you. I want to, to experience the joy that you have in terms of doing fun things. This isn't all about serious ways of using our body, you know. This is like, God wants to experience the whole panoply of fun things and meaningful things that are supposed to happen in life. But, but we, we kind of disallow the full presencing of God in our lives to manifest when we mistreat the very place which he is asking to reside in. And then guess what? Not only is it a gift that he's given us, but it is also a gift that he bought at a price. You see in the scripture again, 
Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, this gift? You are not your own. Your body is not your body. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. How is your body bought with a price? By Jesus giving up his very own body. By God coming down and taking on a body and suffering and dying so that our bodies could be saved and our souls could be saved. So we're given this gift that was bought at a very costly price just because God wanted to reside and dwell within us so much. So when we start misusing our bodies in all number of ways, then we are basically throwing the gift in the face of God, kind of, right? Now, and it might sound really serious and dire, um, you know, uh, God obviously always has grace for us in our mistakes, Right? And these are just realities and facts that we can confront and be like, okay, well, now I have an opportunity to do something better, possibly. I have an opportunity to begin to prepare prepare the place for God's dwelling more and more. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about some benefits of physically flourishing. So we talked about the body is important. We talked about why the body is important. And now we're going to talk about what benefits come along from flourishing physically. So there are four main ways. Now, again, I'm not, uh, you know, an MD or whatever. Uh, I just want to talk about some, some of the major ways that we can highlight how physical health can benefit us. And I'm going to discuss a number of ways that we can kind of optimize those areas of our life, if we will. Now, hold these things loosely. Again, this is not my speciality. Um, but I'm just going to kind of give examples, maybe a couple examples from my own life that you can then take and do whatever you want with. Hopefully, it's just, again, exemplary. Um, number one, physical health, uh, physical flourishing promotes longevity. I believe that we want to give ourselves the best chance to live meaningfully in the world for as long as we can. Now, our lives are ultimately in God's hands, right? And he can sustain it and he can take it away. And there's brokenness in the world that will impact us in ways that we cannot control. However, fundamentally, I think that we should have an, uh, an operating system of believing that we want to do God's work for as long as we can. And that old age provides a unique uh, value to the world, being able to offer wisdom uh, and perspective to younger generations. And we should desire to be able to live for as long as we can, not selfishly because we're holding on tightly to our lives, but because we are giving our life to God and saying, God, I want you to do what you want to do with me as much as you can. It's not about us holding on to our own experiences. It's about us giving our life to God. One of my um, uh, grandfathers recently passed, my, uh, my mom's dad, and for the last... Uh, few years of his life, he suffered terribly from dementia and was, we were kind of unable to, you know, communicate. And I so badly wanted to be able and still do to be able to have those conversations with him about what's going on in my life and what I'm thinking about and what I'm studying in school and what I'm doing in church, how much I would give for him to have had more years in his life to be able to engage with me in that sort of way. And seeing that, though, you know, I'm uh, young and relatively, relatively young and, you know, don't have all of the um, experiences of, of middle life and later life to know what all this will shape up to, to look like. But just watching um, that decline, I, I know how much he had to offer to, to, to me and to the world. And I so badly wished that that was still present. And it it inspired me to want to be able to think more about, you know, perhaps there are genetic concerns that lead towards a proclivity of one developing these sorts of issues in one's life. How can I position myself now to be able to offer the value that I wish that he was able to offer me now? Does that make sense to everyone? So when I was living in London, I was, um, I was, going to a gym there, and the gym had a sauna, and uh, I would use it because saunas help towards muscular development. Again, as you can tell from my tight jacket on. 
Um, and sa- saunas help, uh, you know, post uh, lifting weights, essentially sending blood flow to the muscles and helping recovery, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Probably got two percent, you know, like actual help. I actually don't know what it is. Um, but one of the things is that sauna, consistent sauna use, you know, a certain amount of time over the course of a week, and all, you know, certain temperatures, all that sort of stuff. Uh, in certain cases, can basically have the possibility uh, of having a cardiac-related event. Someone might check me on all this. Hear the spirit of what I'm saying. Can have the possibility of a cardiac event. And so, I'm like 30 years old. I'm not really worried about having a cardiac event, like a heart attack or something, right? But if I don't start caring about it now, when am I going to start caring about it? So I started sitting in the sauna every day and, and, and trying to pre- prepare myself to have longevity so that God can do what he wants to do with my body. We see the importance of, of, of living a long life on this earth, about how that can be a blessing to us. We see that in Proverbs 16 and elsewhere. So I'd like to encourage us to think about how you can position yourself right now to be the healthiest person, to be able to contribute value for as long as you can to God's purposes for the world. I feel feel like sometimes in Christianity, we're afraid to talk about long life because, you know, it's all about the eternal life. Well, God has purposes for you now. Let him maximize you. Physical flourishing promotes cognitive health. We want our minds to be fit so we can do the work that God has given us to do. We see in Romans 12, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, I'm just hydrating, physical flourishing. I'm trying to show you what it looks like right now. Um, Now, we may think of like renewal of the mind being a spiritual process. We're going to like read scripture, pray, the stuff that we talked about. But there's also cognitive, like mental processing implications within the text. A lot of our capacity to judge what is good and pleasing and perfect has to do with our brains just functioning well, our physical brains functioning well. To learn well, to be good thinkers, we can optimize our physical brain makeup to allow ourselves, free ourselves to be mentally renewed. I started doing this, uh, these are all the popular things out there right now. But I was thinking about this because I was in London doing my PhD and I'm literally just sitting looking at a book all day. And I'm like, I wonder if I'm like doing all the things that I can to do this in the most optimal way to take advantage of the opportunity. And I really wasn't doing anything that someone should do. So I started doing things like taking cold showers every day, which can like 2.5x the amount of dopamine that you have running in your body, which is like your, your, like, like a hormone and a, a neurotransmitter that basically is, it's a bunch of things, again, the spirit of it all, right? Um, but but it's, it's, it's the thing that, that, that motivates you, the hormone that motivates you. It's, it's like your will to do something. So if you wake up and you're like, I don't want to do anything today, so take a cold shower. You'll be the most productive person ever. Just kidding. That's not true. But it was just like, what are the little things that I can do so that I can take advantage of the gift that God has given me in my body to do the most that I can with this thing that he's given me? Light in the morning. So important in terms of regulating your circadian rhythms, leading to better sleep, hormone health, less stress. Uh, lifting weights, actually, it's not just some aesthetic thing. It, help, it leads towards mental clarity, longevity in many different ways, mental processing capacities. Um, third of all, physical flourishing promotes emotional mental health. We want our emotional lives to match up with God's emotional life. And we've talked about this in, in previous weeks. And there are tons of things physically. Sometimes our, our emotional issues are not just spiritual, quote unquote, issues. Sometimes they might be. Sometimes you might be really off with God and struggling from uh, 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 certain things that are going on in your relationship with God. But sometimes you might have, right, serotonin issues that are going on in your life. And, and, and you know, you, you have mood issues that are going on. I wasn't particularly maybe struggling with this, but I was like, I want to start trying to optimize this stuff in my life. So I started taking a regimen of supplements that are some of the most proven studied supplements uh, uh, to help be uh, uh, mood stabilizing and boosting. Just because, why not, right? I have this gift. It's like you're putting all the mods on the car, you know, you have, and you're adding all the special stuff to it to make it what you want it to be. Like we have an opportunity to try and make our bodies as best as we can and to maybe uh, uh, help things that are keeping us from engaging with God and the things that he's trying to do through you in this world. And then finally, uh, physical flourishing promotes spiritual health. 
to kind of bring it all back around. When we ask God to help us physically, when we go to him and say, God, your Holy Spirit's within me, can your Holy Spirit help me to become physically healthier? We are also becoming spiritually healthier people. We are potentially unblocking blocked passageways in our body towards experiencing what God has for you. Physical fitness in some sort of weird way can help towards godliness. Now, you may think that, hey, I'm doing okay. I feel good emotionally. I feel good in terms of my cognitive processing. I feel good in terms of these different sorts of ways. I would like to encourage some of us here, because of course all of us are in very different situations right now in terms of how we view and perceive our body, our body image, where we are in our, in our levels of health and stage of life. Uh, but I want to encourage us to think about what are the little things that we can do to become more fit for God. You may think about this in work. You want to get like an extra certification so you can have more opportunities. Think about this with your body, if you will. You know, some of us, my wife and I argue about this sometimes, or used to. We would talk about the amount of hours that we need to get to sleep at night, you know. And she, and she actually can like really function well on like five hours of sleep. She'll pop up in the morning and she'll be like ripping around the entire day. I get the same amount of sleep. I am absolutely dead, non-functioning human being, emotionally, cognitively, all sorts of ways. It gets real bad. And, and it, it, you can think that, well, look, Amanda's good with five hours of sleep a night. Well, when you look at it, it's something like only 5% of the population can sleep five hours of night and actually function in optimal ways. So the likelihood that uh, you are functioning well by getting five hours of sleep is very low right? You may still function high with five hours of sleep, but you could function, imagine how well you could function consistently getting more sleep at night, right? So I would like you to think about this as kind of tweaking and how can I do more? How can I do more for God? How can I give more of my body to God? Okay, so what are things that we can do to, 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 to be better? We're doing a TLCC week of wellness this week, and we have three things that we would like to ask and consider you to do. Some of these things you may already do, and you're a pro at all of this stuff, and some of you may not be doing any of these things, and I'd like to encourage you to consider these. Uh, so first of all, one that we're going to encourage you to do is to refrain from screen time one hour before bed and for one hour after waking up. <sighs> Terribly difficult. And to get 20 minutes of sunlight in the morning to go outside. I know it's really cold, but just, just try it this week. Just see how it goes and try to do it in a rhythm. Go outside. Don't just do it through a window because the window kind of actually halves the effect in most cases of sunlight coming through. And don't look directly at the sun. Let's be intelligent people in the room, but just get that sunlight. Okay. Add 30 minutes of physical activity to your daily routine. Maybe you work out, maybe you lift weights, or maybe you run. Add, just add 30 minutes of, of doing something. Again, taking the spirit of all of this. We all have our unique circumstances. And then a, kind of a wild card, but to show the breadth of how important the physical life is, is that I encourage you this week to physically posture yourself during your prayer time in a different way. How we engage with God physically in those sorts of moments matters. So I encourage you, if you normally just pray, just like sitting down, I believe that it could be a unique opportunity for you to maybe pray uh, kneeling down or pray with your hands up and see how your physical body impacts your relationship with God in that sort of way as well. Okay. Everyone excited for that? Stoke, you're going to do something this week? All right. So in closing, I want to tell you a story that struck me recently. It's about... Um, a woman named Jade Reynolds who suffered from an incredibly rare, rare autoimmune uh, condition. And as she says, within minutes on, 13th, on the 13th of May, 2003, I went from being a healthy 12-year-old girl to being unable to walk or feel much from the waist down. And I've been in a wheelchair ever since. Over the last 20 years, I've regained much of my independence and tried to not let my disability hold me back. But from a young age, my disability gave me a unique perspective. I didn't get sucked into the image-conscious mindset of many of my peers. Many of us think we attract friends by being impressive, but the reality is that deep friendship is usually accelerated through vulnerability. I needed help, so I had to turn to community, which thankfully is exactly what God made us for and something I found in the church. 
Many Christians seem very comfortable praising God for healing. Many Christians seem very comfortable praising God for healing, but not so keen to suffer with those who aren't healed. When we elevate God healing Paul's blindness, for example, over God leaving Paul's thorn in his flesh, we overlook that God does something powerful in both of those instances. What others perceive as a problem isn't a problem for God, she writes. He uses me despite my disability. It's a mighty declaration of his power, which is made perfect in my weakness. And Jade has gone on to become a very prominent uh, Christian on social media, helping to encourage those who are struggling with similar issues as her and reaching millions upon millions of people. And I think it's so important when we're having this conversation, whenever we're talking about the physical body, we have to remember that we live in a world that is physically broken. But having broken bodies does not mean that we cannot flourish. In fact, sometimes it is in our brokenness, in our weakness, that God helps us to flourish in ways we couldn't have imagined. When I was uh, in college, I was playing football in my sophomore year. I, I, I had difficulty standing up straight. I had such bad back issues from a really young age. And it came to a point where I played quarterback and I, I couldn't torque. I couldn't turn my back. Even doing that kind of stuff hurts me right there. I go to a doctor eventually and he goes, uh, if you want to pick up your kid by the time you're 30 years old, you probably need to stop playing. And people who play football through that kind of back injury are normally making millions of dollars, which I was, I guess at that point paying like, you know, 40 grand a year to go to the school to play football. <laughs> so I said, I'm probably going to stop playing football, right? And I'm left, you know, sports had been my identity for my entire life. And I was left with 40 hours a week trying to figure out how, what I was going to do with my life. And I ended up being like, well, I'm at a school that has good theology and philosophy classes and art classes. And I ended up saying, well, I'll fill 40 hours a week with starting to, you know, educate myself around these things and ended up falling in love with it and found you know, my life has ended up becoming about the things that my brokenness opened up the possibility for me to do. And so many of you have way worse issues than that sort of stuff, right? Um, but I just want to encourage us that when we're thinking about physical health in our, our bodies, we just give whatever we have to God, whatever it is. Now, you might be withholding yourself being healthy and being selfish with your body and not giving it over to God. You might be idolizing your body and you need to give it over to God. You might have a physical uh, a, a brokenness thing, a lack of health, and you're letting that keep you from doing things with God. In all of those instances, what are we called to do? Surrender everything to God. Give it all to God. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what you're keeping from him. Let him take hold of all of your life, your spirit, your soul, your body, and say, God, I give my life to you. Make of this thing what you want to make of it. Don't withhold anything from him. All right, if you will, let's stand and sing.